is there something that can move faster than speed of light? In principle, I could make the dot move faster than the speed of light. But we still don't know why the universe is expanding. That's a great question. But that the expansion is accelerating. Simply way as we see these cucumbers. Usually small. Yeah, so the actual and the only proof that can be, that can prove is just a photo of it. Mm. <laughs> Okay, um, basically today we have Dr. Matthew Baumgart as our guest, and we're really happy to have you with our podcast today. Um, we just want to ask you very simple questions about super complicated stuff <laughs> <laughs> that we don't know almost anything about, um, and, you know, just talk about different things in life, uh, how, you know, how, how, how we live life. Yeah. Okay, well, you know, thank you, Ilya and Savali, for this invitation. Really so here. when I was trying to prepare for this podcast, I like I've read quite a bunch of things about astrophysics and theoretical astrophysics, and I've listened to some other podcasts. And so the main idea, as I understood, of theoretical astrophysics, it's like you observe how everything, like how everything is there. You observe the stars, you observe all the other planets, the universe in general. And then you know all the parts, like you know gravity, you know all of those forces, and you're trying to figure out how this all combines together so that the planet is produced, how it is, like, and the star is there. Like you're just trying to figure out how it all works together. I think that's the basic idea. I mean, it combines a lot of physics that you can probe experimentally, by which I mean you're not just observing, but you're actually controlling things. Oh, um, so properties we know about gravity, properties we know about atomic forces, um, but you're letting it go in these, you know, for an Earth-based observer, very exotic environments, cores of stars, um, colliding clusters of galaxies, uh, and you put this all together, and then you see what things you can and can't sort of fit with with physics that we've observed again in more in more controlled settings. Okay. Well, do you actually, like you personally, do you do that now or you just like teach astrophysics? Well, so one thing to clarify is I don't really consider myself an astrophysicist. I'm, I'm more of a particle physicist. Oh. Mm -hmm. So I sort of began my research career working uh, with the Tevatron, which is a particle accelerator outside of Chicago. It shut down about 10 years ago. But when I was a kid, all through my graduate career, it was, uh, it was the world's leading particle accelerator and collider until the LHC turned on uh, in 2008. Um, so, um, you know, as a professor at a research university, you do a mix of research and teaching. Um, typically in physics, again, at, at a place like Arizona State, you're teaching one class a semester. That's uh, certainly a lot of work, especially when it's a new course, but that's probably only taking up something like 30 to 40% of your time, mm -hmm. another 40% of your professional time is going toward research. What is kind of the hardest thing to explain to your students in physics? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, well, one, uh, one topic that came up in my class recently is when you go to discuss quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. um, quantum mechanical world is very different from our everyday world. Mm -hmm. And it seems to be that the way the quantum laws are written, they are not describing direct physical quantities, the way that classical physics is written in terms of you have a position. Okay, that's the position of an object. You have an electric field. Okay, that's an electric field. I can go out and I can, in one shot, measure that electric field. Mm -hmm. What quantum mechanics gives you is an evolution equation for the probabilities to observe things. And so there is this sort of one step removal uh, between what you observe and what the laws are actually written in terms of. And I think that's a difficult concept for people to get their heads around, that, that nature is fundamentally probabilistic and there doesn't seem to be a deeper reality that we can access. Everything is probabilistic for all time and we just you predict the probability to observe a certain experimental outcome, you do experiments, and we believe in quantum mechanics because those probabilities are what 
or what we see reflected in the experiments. Hmm. Yeah. Is it true that the one of the things that don't work in quantum world is gravity? Or or I'm mistaking? <laughs> no, so that's um there is a challenge there. So this gets misstated a little bit. So one kind of cartoon version of the story is like you know, there's these two great successful theories of the 20th century. There is quantum mechanics and there's general relativity. And there's this idea that somehow this is like oil and water. Mm -hmm. um, but in fact, you can, you can build a lot of quantum mechanics into, into gravity. I've written papers uh, doing not very sophisticated calculations, but demonstrating quantum effects in gravity. When you go to combine relativity uh, with quantum mechanics, one generally needs this extension of quantum mechanics known as quantum field theory, which allows you to describe interactions in a way consistent with relativity. If you want to enforce that uh, information can't travel faster than the speed of light, mm -hmm. you need to have an ability to describe uh, physical systems sort of everywhere in space and time. And so you know that these rules are always followed absolutely. When you go to put gravity into quantum field theory, uh, you find that as long as you're asking questions that are fairly low energy, these are energies something like 16 orders of magnitude, uh, uh, sorry, the, the energy scale that you worry about it breaking down is something like 16 orders of magnitude larger than the Large Hadron Collider. Oh. So these are very, very difficult to access experimental energies. For almost everything we can observe, you are far below that scale. And so um, you can make very systematic predictions incorporating quantum effects into gravity. The challenge is a more detailed one, which is to say, but OK, certainly, in principle, we could imagine doing experiments uh, up at those energies. And then it, we don't quite know. Um, it, the quantum field theory approach seems to break down at some level. Um, that's where ideas like string theory come in. Um, or maybe ways to work in quantum field theories, but not sort of the not sort of the first ones you'd write down, but ones that are maybe one dimension lower. They lose the space-time dimension, but it's describing gravity and it's a quantum field theory. Um, okay. That's the sense in which there's a, okay. there's a so there is gravity there, and it gets like misstated all the time. Right. But what's interesting is that. Um, and, and this, is, this is a common thing in physics. And one thing that's satisfying about science is that unlike other human endeavors, like theories predict their own demise. Mm. Uh, you can say like, it is working here, but like the theory tells you like, don't try to put it here. Okay. <laughs> you know, if, you've, if you remember at all of your you know, high school calculus classes and doing something like a Taylor expansion where, okay, you have some complicated function. Okay, but you know, if you're, there's some special point. You should be able to, you, know, you zoom in close enough to a smooth function, it'll look like a straight line. So maybe that's some a plus b times x. And then you want a little more detail, then maybe you add like a c times x squared. And then you want more detail, and you can expand out in powers. But you sort of know that that's generally an approximation. And if, you, if that x is getting very, very, very large, then you sort of know that these things that you're missing are quite important. And so um, generally you need some other way to, to get at them, or you think that your theory breaks down. And so this, this is something that's been appreciated in physics for almost 60 years, that there's a sort of hierarchy in energy scales, and as long as you're working at low energy scales or long distance scales, um, you have a good effective description, and you have some sense for where it should break down. And then in some cases, we know what comes next. Mm -hmm. um, in many cases, we actually have a theory that works to very, very high energies, but to compute with it efficiently because very few quantum mechanical problems can be solved exactly, you actually kind of on purpose uh, throw out information that you possess because it, it's more efficient to describe the experiments that you're interested in. Okay, uh, you just mentioned the uh, speed of light and everything yes. related to that. So is there something that can move faster than speed of light? That's a great question. So. Um, I can give you a very simple way of making something move faster than the speed of light, okay? Yes, please. Take a, take a lighthouse, okay? 
to the lighthouse, that beam of light is going to sweep across in a circle. And there's a very simple equation that relates the uh, angular speed, right? How many degrees that light processes uh, in say a second uh, and uh, a conventional speed, an actual distance, right? So let's say our lighthouse is very fast. It can cover 360 degrees in a second. Okay. okay. So in one second, it sweeps around. The, the linear speed of that spot, the actual, you know, meters per second or kilometers per hour, that sweeps out, um, scales with the radius that you're observing it at, mm -hmm. right? Because it's always sweeping a complete circle. Yeah. It's always the same so, radius. you know, if you think about an old fashioned record, right, the parts that are close to the hole are not spinning as fast as the parts at the edge because the parts at the edge have to travel the same angle, mm -hmm. right? But the circumference is two pi r, so they're having to travel that much faster. So you can do this with the lighthouse, and you just go out far enough. You can make r far enough, um, right? Now this spot is traveling faster than the speed of light. Yeah. So sometimes I used to have a dog that loved to chase my laser, <laughs> and I would tease him that, like in principle, I could make the dot move faster than the speed of light. But this is not a sort of fundamental contradiction with relativity because you can't actually use that dot to send a message faster than the speed of light, mm. right? The dot itself, yes, that can move arbitrarily fast. But if I want to tell my friend way out in space something with that lighthouse, of course, first the beam has to reach mm -hmm. out to that distance and then it's being swept. So there's no contradiction there. Mm -hmm. Similarly, uh, the universe itself can expand faster than the speed of light. Space-time itself can expand. Objects can recede from each other faster than the speed of light, but if they try to signal one another, those signals will always be traveling, um, be traveling shorter, you know, at, at speeds, sub, subluminal speeds. Yeah, I never thought about this idea of lighthouse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you think the universe is expanding or um, contracting? We have very good evidence that the universe is not only expanding, mm -hmm. but that the expansion is accelerating. Mm. Not only are things farther away from us traveling faster, but that speed seems to increase as you, as you go away as well. That, um, that discovery, well, I mean, the expansion sort of established roughly in the 1920s, but the acceleration that discovery was made in the late 90s, more or less right around the time I decided to become a physicist. And it caught a lot of people by surprise. Um, but you could argue that it shouldn't have. Like you, you look at the Einstein's equations, the equations of general relativity, and they admit solutions that have this accelerating expansion. All you need is um, some amount of energy present in empty space. So we, if you think about a sort of, you know, simple physical system, like some electromagnetic setup, or maybe even what I find more intuitive, some gravitational potential, right? Some like obstacle course mm -hmm. that little balls are going to run around on. Um, there will be some minimum energy in that obstacle course, right? You, you knock this ball around. Maybe eventually it finds the deepest point. Maybe there's little shallow places it will rest until you go and hit it again. Um, so this is true for every physical system. There's some state of minimum energy. Yeah. But what we've learned in our study of gravity is that everything with energy gravitates. Even light experiences gravity, even though light has no mass. Um, it still responds to gravity. This was the famous spectacular demonstration of Einstein's general relativity when they observed the deflection of starlight during a solar eclipse shortly after the First World War. Um, so everything with energy can experience gravity. There's some minimum energy in the universe, and if it takes the right value, some, some positive value, the universe will have an accelerated expansion. Now, what's very interesting is why does the universe have that particular yeah, exactly. Energy. This is the so-called cosmological constant problem. For a number of years, people thought, you know, it, it should probably be zero. I don't think there were ever terribly convincing arguments 
for why it should be zero. There's all sorts of energy scales we look out in nature. There's the phase transition where um, the quarks and gluons bind into protons and neutrons and the particles more familiar from our everyday world. That has some amount of energy that was associated with it when it occurred. And yet that doesn't seem to be related to the scale in any, any obvious way, the minimum energy of the universe. And so I, I find this a deeply, a deeply interesting question. And it's been you know, seriously attacked, uh, I'd say in a sophisticated way for 30 or 40 years. And that there's not really a great consensus solution for it. So we still don't know why the universe is expanding. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. It does it mean that if if it expands and accelerates, will we reach you know any some sort of edge of it or any objects that are kind of far away and they get any faster and further? Well, we don't. We don't. We can only observe the observable universe, so we don't understand the maybe the sort of true large scale structure. Mm -hmm. We don't even know the topology of the universe, right? Topology is a mathematical property that's invariant as you squish into form. So is the universe uh, more like a ball, more like a donut, more mm -hmm. like some, something like a donut, but with more than one hole oh, punched yeah. in it? Mm -hmm. um, we, can't, we can't say for sure. So yeah. you know, at some point, maybe we'll expand large enough that we get we get to observe some of some of this structure. But all we can say is that we look out at what we can see right now, and it appears to have this expanding form with an accelerated expansion. Some people speculate, again, because this small positive number is kind of weird and that zero would, I think, appeals to people's aesthetic sense. Uh, maybe it's headed towards zero. So maybe we should see over time that the acceleration is going to decay away and then we'll, we'll just be left with sort of constant expansion or maybe it turns around and then the universe starts contracting, right? Because without something to drive all the matter apart, if you just do a sort of simple high school Newtonian calculation, you think, well, I put all these masses and maybe they're all very far apart, but eventually gravity is universally attractive. Eventually they'll all want to pull toward each other and, and there will be there, there will be this so-called big crunch, right? Which is probably the universe collapsing into one giant black hole. But I think uh, I think it's more likely that we just expand mm -hmm. with an accelerated fashion forever, and then the universe gets to be a very depressing place. So I guess it depends on your <laughs> personality. Do you rather would you rather go out in some you know giant fiery bang, or would you rather have everything? blow apart and just get colder and colder and colder until everyone's just trapped in a cold oblivion. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard about the theory of uh, Michael Brown about the ninth planet? Uh, not particularly. I mean, I think I've heard of things of this form. It's been, it's been, it's already out there, this theory for like eight, nine years. Okay. So they like mathematically proved that there is some planet behind the, the, what is the last planet? Jupiter? No. Well, so when like I was a, when I was a kid, the last planet was Pluto. But yeah, but then they Neptune. but then the Michael Brown said that it's not a, a planet anymore because it's so small. Mm -hmm. But now he claims that there is something, there is some huge mass which is ten times the size of the Earth that affects the asteroids around some planet, and that's how he like he assumes that there is. So a yeah, I, I've there. I've heard of theories of this, or I think sometimes it's called Nemesis. Mm -hmm. People try to tie it to mass extinctions and um, I think it's a rather heterodox meaning like not very broadly accepted hypothesis but mm -hmm. um, uh, you know I'm I'm not a planetary astrophysicist uh, I can only make the sociological observation that this doesn't seem to have broad consensus in the astrophysics community um, but yeah that means maybe, probably maybe there's some maybe there's some anomaly in the data that this is uh, this is trying to cling to um, but again all of these kind of earth shattering uh, explanations right you always do well to bet against bet against them but every now and then right some one of them pays off 
do uh, is it possible that uh, in mathematics uh, the solution looks good and it seems that yes we can we can have this planet but in reality in the universe it doesn't seem to be right so does mathematics really can um, you know make discovery in this sort of sense right I mean science is ultimately observational so you do some data analysis and they have some reason to suspect there's this planet there but um, I think to make that sort of exceptional claim, you need exceptional evidence. And again, just observing this field as an outsider, it doesn't seem like people are buying it. Mm -hmm. So just need, but I mean, again, the, the, the way to win over skeptics, right, is to start to have sort of multiple independent observations that get harder and harder to wave off because sort of any anomaly in the data in any individual experiment, you know, it could be, I don't know, some, some sensor was warmer than they thought, or there's some, some amplifier was noisier, you right? There can always be uh, sort of unknown or uncontrolled systematics, just things going wrong in an experiment or in an analysis. Um, so the way around that is to do many analyses with many different types of instruments. Yeah, so the actual and the only proof that can be, that can prove that there is a planet is just a photo of it mm -hmm. from, taken from telescope, right? Well, I think you could, um, I, I think there are probably other ways to establish its existence. You could see how, I don't know, paths of various comets are deformed in some regular way that would be explained by this mass. You don't necessarily need okay. <laughs> need a photograph. Just a simple question. <laughs> right. I mean, there are all of these sort of other dwarf planets past Pluto. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not terribly familiar with how, how they're established, but they presumably don't put out a large amount of light in reflection. Mm -hmm. um, there, yeah, yeah there, there are other ways to, to determine the existence of something. Okay. Mm, I was just, uh, so you mentioned the string theory. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that um, the string theory basically can combine quantum mechanics and uh, general relativity. Right. And uh, it seems to be kind of the best explanation of our world. And is it true or does it have any um, um, drawbacks, th this whole theory? Is it actually describing our world? Right. Well, I mean, the short answer is we don't know. <laughs> um, as I said before, to really truly probe quantum gravity, you need to get up 16 orders of magnitude and energy uh, above sort of our current state of the art particle physics experiments. So it's quite hopeless that in our lifetime or the lifetime of anyone we know, um, there's going to be such a direct, uh, a direct probe. Now, you can hope that by looking at things out in space, where there are just naturally very high energy processes occurring, maybe most likely you try to go back to the extremely early universe, um, things we can say, because the universe is expanding, if you run that backward, right, that means that things which are now blown up to enormous size at one point were actually quite close, and we're maybe even getting close to the scale of quantum gravity, and that's a possible experimental uh, lever to get to it. So it's important to just state from the outset that if you're trying to do quantum gravity, you are setting yourself up for uh, a very difficult experimental challenge because sometimes people attack the study as mm -hmm. saying that, well, why isn't there any, why isn't there any experimental program for it? Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's a reasonable criticism, um, but it does seem like <laughs> a worthy endeavor to combine quantum mechanics with gravity. There's a lot of uh, non-trivial physics that goes to making this work at even some kind of general self-consistent level. So I, I don't want to litigate whether or not this is worth doing because I think it's clear that it, that it is. But to then turn around and say, well, why isn't there data yet? Well, it, that's because it's actually extremely hard to get, to get that data. I think, again, observations from the early universe are our best bet. But there are a number of people, including myself, including some of my colleagues at ASU, that are trying to think at ways we could experimentally get at quantum gravity, possibly in, um, possibly in other ways. I mean, we have these, in the last decade, we have these very spectacular measurements of classical gravitational waves. This was the LIGO experiment. Um, we're getting very good at detecting um, very small, you know, sub-proton size uh, jiggles in mechanical systems. And so perhaps some sufficiently clever souped up version of that could actually 
detect some jiggle that's fundamentally a quantum gravitational mm -hmm. effect. Uh, we're not there, um, but but it's not maybe as implausible as it was 20 years ago when I joined the field. Mm -hmm. Now, as for string theory itself, of course, it makes a very um, strong claim about the fundamental structure of the universe that it's described by these by these super strings. Um, I find it very compelling. I find the way that it's able to put quantum mechanics with gravity uh, very compelling, um, but it it could be that that's just not mm -hmm. the way the universe works, right? Then there are any number of uh, beautiful, brilliant ideas in the history of physics, things like, you know, the luminiferous ether was this substance out in space that was supposed to propagate light waves, um, but it's wrong. So it's making a very strong claim. It could just happen not to be true, despite all its beauty, despite everything it's, it's teaching us. Um, but it is, say far ahead of its competitors uh, and worth trying to understand um, both how to make sense of the theory itself and then again maybe we're starting to see the first uh, real strong effort to build some sort of experimental quantum gravity program mm -hmm. um, but that's a sort of that's a sort of high risk high reward endeavor because unlike uh, other things in fundamental physics I'd say there's there's not necessarily a guarantee that that's going to find success uh, in, again in, in anyone's lifetime. Yeah, it sounds like we have so many different possibilities of different uh, theories that can explain how we live now, and it's very complicated to basically find a solution to it or prove it. And it's been, uh, it, it always fascinates me about uh, physics. This, this Right, you look at something like quantum mechanics, it's very difficult to see how physicists could have ever come up with that theory yes. until they were being whacked over the head with thing after thing they couldn't explain. Like why, you know, why is radiation, uh, why is radiation glowing more toward the lower energy part of the spectrum as opposed to the high energy part of the spectrum? Why does light behave like a particle when you uh, shine it on a metal in the presence of an electric field that can drive a current? Mm -hmm. um, why when you heat up a gas and you split up the spectrum of the light does it appear in these very sharply defined lines as opposed to just some broad spread of colors like we like you know many sort of generic sources of light um these things all were crying out for explanations and that became quantum mechanics but that was an experimentally driven program so it's possible that we're just sort of shooting in the dark and there's going to be some surprise in the data when we can get there that string theory is just not going to be able to explain the same way the luminiferous ether was just ultimately not able to explain why the speed of light was the same whether you were standing still and watching it or you were moving very fast and watching it. Both of those observers measured the same speed of light, mm -hmm. which is very different from you know throwing a ball on the ground, throwing a ball on the train. That ball will have a different, will have a different speed. Yeah. Have you been to Hadron Collider? Uh, once. Really? When it was being constructed. So I got to go into the, uh, at Atlas, I got to go down into the collision hall under the ground and then the CMS detector I saw on the surface. Really? Yeah, no, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was spectacular. I had, uh, it was the first time when uh, I got interested in kind of physics, how it works. Yeah. Uh, I was in summer school when mm -hmm. uh, there were two brilliant scientists from uh, CERN. Uh, and they were basically shown how physics work uh, onto cucumbers. They were conducting elect electrical current. Mm -hmm. through it. And uh, they were basically explaining that, well, and this is just basic stuff, but all the work that we do in CERN, in Hadron Collider, is also, uh, also it seems complicated. Uh, we kind of understand these particles moving and colliding, and that uh, if you go there, you can also see this at the same time simply way as we see these cucumbers conducting current. Mm -hmm. um, how, how does it help us to understand the universe, the world, the, the world of particles, uh, the Hadron Collider? Is it just because we collide particles? That's or right. How, oh. So, <clears throat> so there are a few things. Um, well, you know, famously, uh, E equals MC squared. Mm -hmm. So uh, for whatever reason, the fundamental laws of nature down to the deepest level we've probed them 
are sort of written in this language of particles. Um, and so if we want to get at new laws of nature, new principles, uh, that seems to require finding new particles. Mm -hmm. And if we haven't seen them so far, that means one of two things. It means either they interact extremely weakly with our everyday world, so they could still be quite light, but just there's some interaction term when you write down the, the equations. And if you make that, you could make that arbitrarily small. Now it's a little funny to think why a number would be finite, but non-zero, but extremely small. But in principle, that's perfectly allowed. Um, so there's this whole class of experiments that tries to go deep underground, uh, shield off all the backgrounds of all the things that, that we observe and try to look for these hints of very rare interactions. Mm -hmm. The other reason we haven't seen a particle is that we just haven't gotten up to an energy where we can just make the thing. And that's where the LHC comes in. Um, there are reasons to think that there are, uh, there are new scales in nature above the ones we've probed. So certainly there's this quantum gravitational scale. Um, there's dark matter is a, is a currently, it's, it's not known how that series of astrophysical and cosmological anomalies are resolved. Um, the physics of the very, early, the very early universe also is going through a period of rapid uh, accelerated expansion. Um, there should be some higher energy scale associated with that. And then there are maybe, uh, maybe some other more minor problems like why are why does the strong force seem to respect the combination of having the laws of physics be the same if you looked at them in a mirror and you changed every particle to an antiparticle? There's also things like we have the particles we've observed, uh, but they all, as far as we know, are getting their mass from the Higgs boson. Yes. You might think that, okay, I have all these particles getting their mass from the Higgs boson, so that's all pretty much the same mechanism. They should all pretty much have the same mass. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we see. Um, there's, uh, there's um, let, let me try to think of the relative scales here. So neutrinos have masses at the milli EV scale. So that's 10 to the minus three EV. The proton has a mass of 173 GeV. So that's, um, 10 to the 11 EV. Mm -hmm. So already just in physics that we've known and we've worked with experimentally for at least two decades now, uh, you have this sort of 14, 15 order of magnitude hierarchy. Why is that? Um, <laughs> probably it's because of physics occurring at an energy scale that we haven't, that we haven't probed yet. So that's the reason why you build a machine like CERN and then hopefully you build a larger machine uh, to go to even higher energy. There's also this interesting um, kind of connection between the uh, scales of energy and the scales of distance. If I want to probe very, very short distances, I need larger and larger energies. And you can think of this with the physics of waves, that if my wave, if I'm trying to get at something, you know, the width of my fingernail and my wave is say the wavelength of this room, it's very difficult for something, uh, for a probe sort of that crude to say anything about a scale that small. If you want to probe something, the scale of my fingernail, you should have waves that are kind of of the order of my fingernail. Um, and what we've known in quantum mechanics for a long time is that energy scales with the frequency of a wave. So if you want to just get to the physics of the very small, um, somewhat ironically, that leads you to the physics of very large energies, and as if and if humans are involved to produce these large energies, right? You need these enormous machines, right? So the fact that CERN is, you know, miles in circumference to probe, you know, directly the smallest scales that we can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I recently started. just read that uh, this is just interesting fact that uh, this uh, so they started at one point and then twenty seven kilometers in length, mm -hmm. and they still ended up one centimeter difference. It's just fascinating how precise it is, right. how they did it. Um, but I was also curious that I've read somewhere that uh, we think about the world in terms of atoms. Uh, 
but what uh, particle physics also tells us is that uh, basically atoms is just interpretation of these uh, little particles. Is it is it true or should we look at physics or the whole world in terms of not atoms, but all these little particles? So I, I, th I think it's fair to say that, um, yeah, the, the modern perspective, an atom, take a take out a, a conventional atom like carbon, right? It's yeah. um, <laughs> it's a mix of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Yes. So the protons, neutrons, and electrons seem to be a more fundamental description. I can write down the physics of those things and describe carbon. It's very difficult to say, start with carbon as your building block and yes. mm -hmm. write down the physics of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And then you can go in the protons and neutrons themselves. You can go one level deeper and they're themselves composed of quarks and gluons. Yeah, so what's the most fundamental particle then? Well, there's there's a collection of particles known as the standard model. Mm -hmm. Those are the most fundamental particles we've observed and they come in a variety of forms. So there's the neutrinos, which are the lightest, they're neutral, um, so the, the lightest except that, that, that um, the lightest that have any mass at all. Um, there are electrons and things like electrons. Those are muons and taus. Then there are quarks and gluons, but we don't observe quarks and gluons directly. Uh, things that experience the force that quarks and gluons are charged under always, if you let them sit for any amount of time, uh, bind themselves into sort of neutral objects. Uh, this is known as the physics of confinement. And so what you actually observe is this giant zoo of particles uh, known as hadrons. So there's things like pions, kaons, mm -hmm. omegas, lambdas. Um, but in there are the, the neutron and the proton that we're very familiar with. Mm -hmm. sorry, it's, I have it's this, oh, yeah. sorry, sorry, I have this very simple question. In all of my physics classes that I've taken so far, we assume that electron has zero mass. No, that, that, that's not true. But Are you not... thinking of the photon or? No, I assume that the electron has negative one charge right and it has zero mass so when we calculate mm -hmm. when we put it in the equation it's zero but in fact it's not zero right it's a little bit above zero but it's way smaller than proton or neutron that's why we make it like zero right so when you're talking about mass scales or energy scales then it's um you always have to say large or small relative to what so zero is a very is right is a very special number. Mm -hmm. um, is the electron mass small? Well, for the most part, usually small in the sort of questions we're asking. But if you're comparing it to uh, neutrino masses, well, it's actually possibly a billion times more massive than the neutrino. So as far as the neutrino is concerned, the electron is like a brick wall. The sort of the meaningful quantities in nature are basically dimensionless numbers, numbers that carry no units. So you want to take the ratio of the electron mass to the neutrino mass, the electron mass to the proton mass. But yes, compared to the proton, um, it's about 2,000 times lighter. So yeah, you can probably neglect it as massless. Of course, you have to be careful because sometimes if you make something massless, it wants to move at the speed of light. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it can't. Relativity. Um, yeah. It just depends on the level of physics. Like the way you study physics is like super high level and you can't just assume that. But I am taking like physics one three one, yeah. and they just like assume that the electron is zero for our equations. So it's a uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a, uh, I mean it, it, it's always good to be able to take shortcuts and set things to yeah, zero yeah, yeah, when you yeah, can. Yeah. But it's it's funny you mention that because I'm actually finishing up a paper with one of my grad students right now, which is kind of exactly about this question: when can you, when can you set a particle mass to zero in a calculation? Um, because there's this. When you compute the physics of particles being produced in high energy collisions, it's not very hard to cook up a situation where if you set the particle mass to zero at the start of your calculation, which you might think you can because <laughs> the electron's so light compared to every other energy scale in the problem, uh, or if you set it to zero at the end of your calculation, you can actually get a different answer. Because in sort of computing the integrals, doing the intermediate steps that come along, you can get contributions that look like m squared, the squared mass of the particle, over m squared, the squared mass of the particle. So 
the mass squared divides away. And now say you're just left with one in some units of counting. Um, now I want to set the mask to zero. So everywhere it explicitly appears, those go away. But this term survived. But if you'd set the m squared to zero up front of the calculation, it wouldn't have been there. Uh, and so we're, uh, we're, we're understanding exactly when you do and don't keep track of that particle mass. And basically, the, the idea, and, and it, it all goes back to a, actually one of uh, a paper by a brilliant Soviet physicist in 1990 named Andrei Smilga, that uh, you, know, you should think about when you're producing particles in a very energetic collision energy is much larger than their mass, you're not really making the physical particle that's going to be detected. You're making some particle which is virtual, which is very far from the exact mass and energy conditions it needs to have to propagate in the world. Um, so it's going to, but particles want, in a sense, want to be real. <laughs> so they spit out a lot of radiation. And then as they lose this energy, uh, they can become their sort of real propagating selves and be detected. And so if you're making this particle far, far, far from its mass at some enormous energy scale, yeah, you can treat it as massless. If you're right at the scale of the particle's mass, you should keep track of its mass, but that's not a big surprise, okay. right? If I'm, if I'm just kind of breathing on my electrons, then it makes sense that, that the electron mass is gonna be an important scale in the problem. But we have a way to sort of work this out systematically when you do and don't need to keep track of the mass because you might say, well, even if I probably don't need the mass, surely it's not a mistake to include it. I mean, it really does have the mass, but that actually gives you, that gives you incorrect, that gives you incorrect results. Okay, now I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have one, just one question that bothers me all the time about zeros. Uh, is zero, absolute zero temperature reachable? And in my understanding that uh, it is unreachable because um, particles stop moving at this temperature, at zero Kelvin. Why is that? Is it true? <laughs> um, great. So I think it's very unlikely that you could ever reach absolute zero in a strict sense because you're starting with a system of finite energy. Mm -hmm. There's only so much you're going to be able to sort of pump out cool the thing down. So it's difficult for me to see how you could ever make that work in practice. But in principle, I have no objection to there being some toy universe which exists at absolute zero and the energy never needed to be removed in the first place. Again, how you would set this up, I don't, I don't know. But if you just start with it. How it might look like if uh, there is universe with absolute zero temperatures. It would be very boring. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like nothing is happening there. Yeah, that, I don't see how. Yeah, I don't see how much, how much evolves in that in that universe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a good point because I thought that you know we were we used to be taught in school that absolute zero temperature is impossible and it's just how much it is two two hundred seventy three kelvins minus right. So oh well zero zero Kelvin minus two seventy three Celsius oh it's Celsius yes it's minus two Celsius but actually temperature is even lower than this kind of possible to reach or is it not true? Well, there is a sort of exotic branch of physics where you can you can make negative temperatures mm -hmm. uh, be a meaningful concept, but they don't really have less energy than absolute zero. In fact, negative temperatures are hotter. Than uh, are hotter than positive temperatures, uh, <clears throat> in a, in the sense that I think energy would flow out of the negative temperature into the into the positive temperature, just like energy always flows from oh. the hotter body into the colder body. This is the second law of thermodynamics. But again, for absolute zero, I you know again in practice you'll never get there. But in principle, I could you know imagine getting arbitrarily close, and if. And if you can get arbitrarily close, then I mean, to me, that that's a meaningful, that's a meaningful concept. So negative temperatures are hotter than hot temperatures. This is <laughs> I'm I'm stepping far away from my expertise, but this okay. this is my memory. No, it's just nice sentence. Uh, what do you think about space sales? It's just back to space <laughs> question. <laughs> Yeah.
Or yeah. Something. Well, the problem with space sales is that you need an enormous. So, what do you want to do? You're trying to push a spaceship very far, very fast. So, you need to put an enormous amount of energy into that spaceship. So, regular everyday materials, they reflect some light, they absorb some light. Okay. So, you want to make them as reflective as possible. But if I make it 99.999% reflective, then I don't know, I lost track. That's some number of 0. 0.0001 absorptive. Mm -hmm. so, it's going so, I, so I take that tiny number, then I multiply it by an enormous energy, and that's energy the spaceship is absorbing. And I don't see how you do this without vaporizing the spaceship. Um, again, I, this, this is not what I do. Okay. Uh, I haven't looked at these numbers in a while, but my sense is that like you need materials that are just significantly more reflective than anything we've come up with to date. But you know, technology makes progress. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you start with, you know, if you could send something right the size of a smartphone to yeah. the to the nearest star, that would be like an incredible achievement. And maybe since that mass isn't so big, you don't need so much energy, so you don't need so much reflectivity um, but that's that's the challenge yeah so you mentioned that uh right now the like astrophysics world is expanding a lot and exploring a lot because of technologies right so what is like what do you think what technology do we need in order to like make even more explore exploration like do we need better telescope or better better uh, spaceship or but what what do we need to improve uh probably better telescopes Better way, I mean, something that would be a, you know, if, if you're looking at like true game changers, right? Something like a space elevator. Mm -hmm. right? If you could, <laughs> if you could dramatically reduce the cost of getting things up into orbit, right? Then it gets a lot cheaper to go to space. You can do a lot more science in space. I mean, my sort of plausible fantasy experiment are these sort of space-based gravitational wave detectors, where now you're not talking about, um, detection arms on the scale of a kilometer, but detection arms on the scale of millions of kilometers. And you can look, you can just look at much more sensitive gravitational wave singles because everything with energy gravitates, which is to say everything gravitates. Um, uh, detecting the gravitational waves of physical systems is sort of one of our best ways at getting at parts of the universe we haven't, we haven't accessed yet. But I mean, there are plans to do these experiments, you know, with just conventional satellites on rockets mm -hmm. um, but maybe you do something much bigger and more intricate once you can again put it on the space elevator yeah it's like it's also like a space travel um would you like to travel to space and there was like a shuttle and just <laughs> nah, I'm, I'm good <laughs> <laughs> i prefer to travel around the mediterranean <laughs> that's, that's a good choice very nice area <laughs> Um, I was just thinking about uh, space travel and that is it possible that it might happen uh in our lives that, you know. I mean, you already have, I mean, Virgin Galactic mm -hmm. and people that have, you know, way more money than I do, but like not, not just in, you know, not necessarily crazy amounts of money going up into near Earth mm -hmm. orbit. It's not implausible to think that by the time I'm dead, maybe like regular upper middle class folks or middle class folks could, could do something similar. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, just that just seems like such a plausible stretch. If you think about the trajectory of air travel, right? Who was flying on airplanes in the 1930s was, you know, the economically elite stratum of society. And now it's basically anyone in the developed world. Um, so that, that seems very plausible. But going deeper into space, I, 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 that, seems, that seems more challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I just have very, I just remember I had very kind of stupid question uh, about, so you mentioned uh, how things reflect uh, light. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking about the glass and what color is the glass, like the regular one. I know that we have different you know, pink glass or something like this, but just regular C, um, CO2, SiO2 glass. Okay. What color is this? It, 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 it seems that it's, it doesn't have color at all. Right, so usually when something looks uncolored, it's because what it's reflecting is all frequencies, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I mean, it'd be an interesting experiment. I, I could even imagine how you do it, but I'm guessing that if you were to take the light reflecting off 
the glass or maybe off this plastic bottle, mm -hmm. you would see that it, I mean, really the light that you're seeing off of it is white. Yes. Which is why it looks uncolored. Um, mm. But of course, much of the light is going through it, right? Which is why, you, why it's transparent. Hmm. <laughs> I was just thinking that uh, I think I discussed it with my friend that we were, he, he was also a physicist and he told me that, oh, uh, it's actually green because if you just cut it and then you look in, at the surface where you just cut it, it all seems to be green for some reason. No, I, yeah, and I, I, I believe that some of the earliest silicon oxide glasses were mm -hmm. green and it was kind of an innovation to get Mm, to get so. glass that didn't have that pigment. So maybe there is there, there could be something to that. And again, maybe if you did the spectral analysis, you would find that it is oh, okay. a bit more green yeah. than other colors, um, but doesn't look green mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, from a lot of perspectives. Mm -hmm. yeah. Towards the end of every podcast, we have this, my favorite topic, it's called quiz. So I answer, que I, I ask questions like shortly, but you may answer not shortly. It's up okay. to you. All right. Uh, do you look at the stars in order to relieve stress? Sometimes. Sometimes. Usually with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the next one is, uh, what is the best thing technologies have given us? Oh, uh, well, I mean, fire was pretty useful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is the, I mean, do you want to quantify that for... <laughs> You know, just uh, fire is a good answer too, but you know, technology that we have now in modern world. A modern technology. Well, being in Arizona and all, I guess I have to, I have to appreciate uh, air conditioning. And <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. uh, I love, I love living here, and that's that's only possible thanks to, thanks to the air conditioner. <laughs> what would you advise to your younger self? Oh. Um, I think I would tell myself that, uh, and, and this is advice I give to, to students as well, that uh, you shouldn't beat yourself up about what you're producing as an output. You should just focus on putting the time into what you're trying to do. Make that its own sort of internal reward. Well, maybe I didn't get a lot done today, but I did like, so I, did, I did go at it for six hours. Mm -hmm. I wrestled with it. And if you, can, if you can do that over and over again, then the progress you're actually trying to make will happen. But it's, I think it's important, especially when you're starting out, to give yourself like, a, a plausible goal. Like I, and I, and I, I try to figure this out as an instructor now. Is like, you, know, you can tell people, like, oh, just do awesome. Yeah. <laughs> right? But what, what you really want to do is like, give people something that you know, a, a well-intentioned student who's willing to work hard they put that time in, they can succeed with it. Um, so in a class, that's pretty, re pretty easy. With, when research, with research, of course, it's more difficult because the whole reason it's research is you don't know if this problem necessarily has a resolution. Um, but I think if you just focus in putting in the effort, um, then progress follows. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's like, uh, the, it's not the end goal, it's the process that you go to this goal. Right, right. But you can't, you know, I can't, uh, but if you just focus on what you're sort of doing day to day, well, most days in research are pretty frustrating. Or you make negative progress, like, oh, that idea I've been working on for the last two months, I just realized today it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, and so it's very easily, it's very easy to get demoralized that way. Um, but if you make yourself feel good about, well, at least I, at least I went to the office, or I went to the coffee shop, and I, I integrated like, six you know thoughtful hours on this project well that's that that's what you can feel good about and if you do that day after day after day like progress will get made yeah that's a good thing um harvard or asu <laughs> oh i i like asu oh that's that's so cool <laughs> uh would you rather live in the same town for your entire life or move to a new town every year well, when you're a postdoc in science, you move to a new town every two or three years. Uh, and while I did enjoy that, uh, it's, you know, it, you need different things at different phases of your life. I think for probably most kids benefit from being more or less in a stable mm -hmm. environment, developing long friendships. Uh, I, I did not move between when I was two years old and when I went, uh, when I went off to high school. 
um, I think that was beneficial. I think when you're, when you're younger, 20s and 30s, before you have a family, maybe it's just you or you and a partner, then I think it's, I, I did really enjoy living in all these different cities. And fate sent me to places that are not maybe most people's first thought of where they want to spend time, cities like Baltimore and Pittsburgh and New Jersey, but I, I, I loved all of them. Like most places that have good universities are good places to live. Um, and, and at least certainly on a, on a the time scale of, of a few years. Um, but again, most people want to have families. So that's probably, again, a period of your life where you want to settle down. And that's stressful and complicated enough that if you can avoid throwing multiple moves into the mix, that's probably also beneficial. Um, what we don't seem to have in our society, what would be nice is maybe once your kids leave the nest, if you could again <laughs> go through a churn of... <laughs> Moving, uh, moving every two to three years, but maybe by the time I'm in my sixties, seventies, I, I won't feel like doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, but nobody stops you. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you need to. I mean, it's a, uh, it's it's a funny time because it's uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of freedom, mm -hmm. but with a lot of freedom also comes a lot of insecurity. Mm -hmm. So it's great to move every two to three years, but it's also very stressful to have in your head always this constantly ticking clock. In two to three years, I have yeah. to find another job. <laughs> oh, right. And so that's maybe something I don't need to relive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, would you rather win the lottery jackpot or a Nobel Prize? Oh, I mean, I gotta take the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you rather make only a little money working at your dream job or make a billion dollar, uh, but it's the worst job ever? Well, it depends what you're doing for that billion dollars. But I think, again, most people that, are, that have gone an academic route are probably choosing to make less money to do something they find more engaging. Like, could have made more money going into finance, going into tech, going into consulting. Um, but I chose a different route. So, but you could, you could dial that question to an extreme where, no, of course I'll take, <laughs> of course I'll take the billion dollars. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, and basically, this is everything for our podcast. And thank you so much for coming to our podcast episode. Oh, well, it was my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. What's your favorite quote? My favorite quote, science makes progress one funeral at a time. I don't actually know who says that. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, no, I never heard of it. That's interesting. Well, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure.